Right, right. I was just going to say, is there an on or off? But clearly it's on, so we will get started. My name is Margaret Mitchell, and I'm president and CEO for the YWCA of Greater Cleveland, and we're really excited to have all of you here for a conversation about moving away from Native American um, mascots in sports. And joining me today are two esteemed guests. I'm really excited that you're going to have an opportunity to hear from both of these indiv individuals. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Because usually, when you introduce other people, you sort of give away all of their good energy um, for their introduction. So um, would you start? Hi, Ani and Dindisikwe and Dishnikas, Aji Jack and Dodum, Waganakasingo Dao and Donjaba. Hello, my name is Cynthia Connolly. My Anishinaabe name is Blue Jay Woman. I am a citizen of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. That's located in Northern Michigan, and I'm from the Crane Clan. I, uh, I'm on the executive board of the Lake Erie Native American Council, uh, and I work full time at Policy Matters Ohio, a nonprofit research institute, uh, as a development director. I've been a Clevelander for almost 15 years now, and I'm originally from Detroit. Thank you. Suntan. Hinge J, greetings. Uh, my name is Sundance, and I am the executive director of Cleveland American Indian Movement. I am also uh, a member of the elders table of uh, Akron. I am a member of the Oberlin Indigenous Peoples Day Committee. I am happy to be here, um, and I am happy to be speaking with both of you. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. You know, so often, when we begin conversations, we will start with a land acknowledgement. But today I would love to hear from you, Sundance, if you could share a little bit about this land and the Erie people um, and what you would have us know and learn that we might not. So the Erie people, this is their traditional territory. Um, they occupied land south of Lake Erie, Lake Erie is named after the Erie people. Um, the Jesuits, who were the first missionaries in this area, did not really have very much contact with Erie people. Um, by the time the colonizers, or settlers, as you will, uh, came to this area, the Erie had been dispersed um, due to pressures of colonization, in particular the Beaver Wars. Uh, the Erie were an the Erie Confederacy were uh, an Iroquoian peoples, and they spoke a language similar to the Wyandotte, who came to this area as well, from uh, north of Lake Erie. And both of those people were dispersed to some uh, extent due to pressures uh, during the Beaver Wars in the mid-1600s uh, until the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701. Uh, the Erie people were then absorbed by the Seneca and uh, returned to Ohio after the Great Peace of Montreal and were called uh, Mingo, and that was a term used to describe uh, any Iroquoian people who were not under the authority of the Five Nations Haudenosaunee. If I could also add, too, um, th Cleveland is one of eight select cities during the uh, Urban Relocation Program, which is a federal policy that was enacted from the 1950s through the 1970s. And this was a policy that was done during what's called the termination era. And that sounds pretty accurate to what exactly you think it is. The goal was to terminate uh, sovereign statuses of tribal nations, to lessen their federal trust responsibility over Native people. And that was th their solution to what was called, quote, the Indian problem at the time. So what they did is they bust Native Americans, literally from reservations, to eight select cities, um, just eight or nine of them. And Cleveland was one of those cities. And because of that, we have a significant urban native population um, with tribes representing over like 100 nations here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so I also want to acknowledge the fact that we are still here today. We have a vibrant, amazing community here. Uh, and we're everywhere. We're your neighbors, coworkers, your classmates. And uh, while there's a rich history, there's still a very rich, modern um, uh, community here today. There's an amazing community here, and 
you all, you both have done um, an incredible job of elevating and raising uh, the conversation, the profile, and the people. And I think for so many of us, um, you know, what you just shared, I think for many listening, is going to be new information because of the way our educational system has hidden or um, characterized or told the story in a way that doesn't fully represent indigenous native people. There's the, the, the thread is Christopher Columbus, and on and on and on. Um, but education is changing. What are your hopes for our education system and being able to tell? Because I think the education system feeds into the way and the ability to even have mascots because of the single, it, it, it's as if Native Americans, indigenous Americans, indigenous people are one dimension, mascots. So and a lack, of, a lack of real education, the complexities, the depth, the truth, yeah. doesn't allow us to understand, appreciate, value, and see the people. Yes, see the people, right? Uh, there was a recent study done um, by this one national nonprofit called Illuminative, uh, run by Crystal Echohawk, and w they surveyed thousands of people, analyzed tens of thousands of social media data, dozens of focus groups across the country, and there's some really striking findings that they had in there. They found that two-thirds of Americans have never met or know a Native American person. Two-thirds have never met or know a Native American person. Just think of how much you learn from other people, other cultures, uh, just by proximity, right? So that is a really striking problem. And I think the second thing that we've learned um, from another study is that only 87% 80 of K through 12 curriculum fails to talk about Native Americans after the year 1900. 87% fail to talk about us after the year 1900. We just drop off the map. Um, and so we're inadvertently uh, educating people of our historic existence only. Uh, we're not modern people. We're not taught about our, our modern existence. And I think I have one really good example, and I actually wrote it for a blog for the YWC of Greater Cleveland. Uh, so again, I grew up in Detroit, and on a field trip I took in um, elementary school, we went to the Ann Arbor Natural History Museum. And the first floor was nothing but fossils, right? Next floor, dinosaur bones. Next floor, extinct animals. Last floor, Native Americans. And I remember looking at this wall of dioramas and pointing to one of them that said it was the Ottawa Nation and, and looked at my classmate and said, I'm Ottawa, like that. And he looked at me and said, you can't be Indian. Indians are extinct and left. And it, you know, at the time, I was more mad about being called a liar because I knew like full well what I was and was not. And I was not a liar, and I was Native. And, but if you reflect on that, what do you expect a nine-year-old you know, kid to think after seeing three floors of extinct animals and dodo birds and fossils? Um, it's really implanting that seed of us as a historical people, uh, not as a modern people. And they have no opportunity to see the other side. Um, and that's how I get question, questioned about my identity by a classmate, right? Um, and so that perpetuates into it. And when people have no, and there, this is another thing that the study found, when people have no idea of who we are as a modern people, it's statistically significant. They found that they are least likely to support our social justice issues in the 21st century if they have no idea what our modern issues are. Our invisibility and lack of representation is the modern form of racism our people face today. You know, when I hear you tell that story, and of course I read um, the blog and I think about Native children and the impact that everything you just said has on the hearts of Native children and non-Native children, what that does. And I think that um, we know what data says about how detrimental mascots are. 
And I'd love for you, uh, Sundance, just to talk a little bit about that and, and your thoughts. Well, I mean, so the, the mascot issue is really an important issue. Now, certainly it is not as important as many of our issues. It's certainly not as important as the disproportionate amount of murdered and missing indigenous women that is endemic, not only in the United States, but, but in Canada. It's certainly not as important as we who are 1% of the population, but we are twice as likely as the next ethnic group to be assaulted by someone of a diff different ethnic group. But the mascot issue does breed an environment where these issues that we have will not be addressed and certainly uh, will not be solved. So, you know, the mascots, when you, when you look at them, they don't speak anything to our contemporary experience. They, they portray us as people of the past. Certainly you don't have the Indian mascot that is a lawyer or a doctor. And I think that that is part of the effects of colonization, but certainly part and parcel of the move to replace indigenous people. These mascots create, promote, maintain racism that we experience. Now, I, I have a son who is in the school system. I, I know many Native people who have children in the school system. And certainly, we have gone through the school system, and not only in Ohio, but in throughout the country. And when you ask a Native person what did your educators teach you about Native issues? Predominantly, you hear nothing. We were not taught. We taught our educators. Mm -hmm. And when you expand the dialogue as to who is a Native person, just like Cynthia shared her story, you can't be Native. You don't look like Native. You know, we're not a race of people. We are different ethnicities, and we're certainly not monolithic. But when you talk to people who are not Native, who have lived under the auspices of these mascots, they have an idea, a stereotypical idea, of who we are and who we were. That is problematic for everyone. And, you know, I get calls almost every week from people who, in, in fact, we have a table downstairs, and someone came by just the other day and said, I did not know that I was Native. Uh, that was hidden from me. You know, our elders hide certain information when they believe that to relay this information to us is going to be detrimental for us. And so when you expand the dialogue of who is Native, which we have to do because we live under this basically propaganda, you find that the authentic Native experience is very varied. Oftentimes, when we talk with people who don't know anything about Native people, they ask, the first question is, are you full blood? What, whatever does that mean, am I full blood? I mean, my blood goes right to the top as with every other Native person that I know. Certainly, the question implies that if you do not fit within a certain box, you cannot relay to people what the authentic Native experience is. 
the authentic Native experience is not only people who have been reservationized, the authentic Native experience is also those people who have lived among our colonizers, hidden. And so when we try to expand that dialogue, we get pushback. And the pushback really doesn't come from any type of informed atmosphere. It comes from an atmosphere of stereotype. We and really love a simple narrative, don't we? Um, and I think it's to our, our, our detriment that we always try to simplify um, any, any narrative. And um, you know that came across loud and clear Sundance. I, Cynthia, just to stay with the impact on children, mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So there's actually hard evidence in studies that have come out in the last decade that show full stop these mascots have detrimental impacts on our communities and especially our children. Um, some of the more notable ones are by, do by Dr. Stephanie Freiberg. She's now at the University of Michigan. And her more recent study showed that there are zero positive outcomes for native youth when they're exposed to uh, stereotypical native imagery like sports mascots, zero. Uh, what they did find is that there was uh, increased uh, negative feelings of stress and depression. There's, uh, it contributes to low self-esteem, low community worth. Um, and this is really important because our, uh, our youth, we have a suicide rate that is 3.5 times higher than the average. Uh, and we're, that is a, a legitimate issue that we're, we're struggling with here. And this fuels a lot of the racism, as, as Sundance had said, um, that brings to like the missing and murdered indigenous women, that leads to pr police brutality, that fuels bias against our people uh, and makes us more likely to be victimized or uh, subject to prejudice. Uh, this type of bias works its way into laws and policies there are Supreme Court cases that are being argued at our nation's highest court with these biases worked into decisions. Um, so it really does come back and like directly harms our communities. And I think for like kind of another highlight with these studies that, that Freiburg did is while there are zero positive outcomes for our native youth, there is only one positive outcome and it was for one specific group, their white peers. Their white peers had a boost in self-esteem when viewing these native mascots. So at the expense of native youth, uh, their white peers get that boost of self-esteem. So whenever someone says, but we're honoring you, it's literally not, full stop, that is what the data is saying. I, I think we're learning so much that um, if I can only be tall by making you walk on your knees, um, you know, something's really significantly wrong with that, with that picture. Sundance, I know that there is movement uh, in, uh, I think you had mentioned South Dakota and another state in terms of looking um, at this mascot issue across the states. And if you could talk a little bit about um, the movement that is uh, happening um, to uh, er eradicate negative stereotyped uh, mascots, particularly indigenous mascots um, in schools? Well, so there, there is movement. Um, two weeks ago, the state of Colorado outlawed the use of native mascots. Um, last week, South Dakota followed suit. And that's very positive for us as indigenous people. I mean, those states have a very large representation of uh, indigenous people. Um, there are little known movements. So 2012, the um, Michigan Department of Civil Rights filed a suit against the United States uh, Department of Education because of the number of mascots in Michigan that were not self-representation. And we're not saying necessarily that all mascots are wrong. If you are a native people, 
and you choose to self-identify in that manner, that's really your right. But when it becomes exploitation, that is something that is completely different. Now, the uh, lawsuit that was filed against the Department of Education came to Cleveland to be heard. And of course, as one would expect in this environment, and especially at that time where we had Wahoo plastered all over the place, it was ruled that there was nothing wrong, nothing wrong. And so since that time, we have had a number of schools across the country get rid of these mascots. We have had a few states say that this is wrong. Uh, certainly in the uh, 2005, the NCAA came out and said, you can no longer use a native mascot and think that you are going to participate in a tournament. So we've had a lot of movement, but because we are such a small population and you know, a, an invisible population, no one has taken any notice. Certainly sports fans, uh, many of them did not know that NCAA had taken that step so long ago now. So it's important for us, the native people who are still here, to continue our basically agitation to say, look, we need to be heard and you need to see us. And when we talk about native issues, whether or not we use the term Native American, whether or not we use the term American Indian, whether or not we use the term, term indigenous, we need to be taken seriously. I like to note that, you know, in Cleveland, we hear Indians, 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 pre-season, during the season, post-season, but nothing talks about the experience of indigenous people. That's right, and, and you were referring to Cleveland MLB. Um, and I want to reference and go back to invisibility and mascots. And for me, when I think, again, when I think about gender-based violence against indigenous women and the underreporting of that violence, I am able, I personally am able to see the thread between mascots and our ability as a country to suppress or turn away, have a blind eye, not understand um, the, the depth and the richness of indigenous people. And because we don't see it makes gender-based violence, in my opinion, against indigenous women um, so detrimental. It makes it possible. It makes it, it the, the reporting. I mean, as a woman, you know, if I don't feel seen and heard, <laughs> I, I just, for me, there is, such a close tie to the thread um, around the mascots and gender-based violence. It isn't a leap for me. It is not a leap. You know, violence against indigenous women has been endemic in this hemisphere since 1492. Columbus wrote in his journal that girls, not women, girls from the ages of eight to 10 were the most popular amongst the Spaniards who colonized Hispaniola, modern day Cuba, uh, modern day um, Haiti. And to me, that is just abhorrent when we look at mascots per se. It certainly gives uh, an impression that men in native cultures are somehow the leaders. We're, we're not the leaders. 
we follow a matriarchal system, many of us. And our cultures are built upon the backs of our women. Women carry our traditions. Women determine how our children are educated and the self-worth that we try to impart to our youth. And so the, the mascot, any of them, they don't speak to any of, of that history and certainly don't speak to any of uh, our cultures because they allow patriarchy to continue in such a way that we cannot overcome the violence done towards our women. A as you may note, historically, only men are Indians. Only men. Women are squaws. And that, have, that is how they have been portrayed historically. And that is how they continue to be portrayed as nothing more than property of settlers. We have a crisis in this country of how indigenous people are portrayed. Uh, I had mentioned it a little bit ago about how we're constantly uh, thought of in the 1800s. Uh, when I do presentations, and I do these presentations to like third grade classes, library, senior centers, one of the first questions I ask is, picture a Native American in your head. What's the first thing that pops into your mind when I say, think of a Native American? My next door neighbor in Fresno, California. My next door neighbor in Fresno, California. <laughs> 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 they were indig an indigenous family. Yeah. So <laughs> again, proximity, right? Proximity, But for the two-thirds of people in this country who have never met or know a Native person and are probably one of the 87% of schools that do not talk about Natives after 1900, the first thing that pops in their head, and anecdotally from my presentations, feathers, tomahawks, teepees, chief wahoo. And so I say, can anyone name a Native American? Squanto, you know, Sacagawea. Can anyone name a Native American that, you know, is either still alive or has been alive in the last 20 years? Crickets. And it's awkward because I literally just introduced myself as an indigenous woman and I'm standing right in front of them and they could have just said my name. <laughs> um, but it, it's very difficult for people to picture us um, in, this, in the 21st century. There, we're permanently what I called feathered and leathered in the 1800s. And so that false narrative is very toxic and it leaches into every aspect of American culture and, and into policies, like I said, into laws that um, when people don't have an understanding of who we are, of our sovereignty, of our ability to self-govern, of our, our culture, our, our spirituality, um, how um, you know, our households work, right? So now we have an epidemic of, of children being taken, uh, which is why we needed the Indian Child Welfare Act, because like, you know, tons of kids were being snatched out of their homes because uh, non-natives had no idea of the way our culture works for raising children in the household. They didn't see it as fit. And so we had children being snatched and put into non-native homes, again, promoting that cultural genocide, right? And so this starts perpetuating, and you find this leaching into other areas um, of, of our law, and especially for native women, especially for native women. We are hypersexualized, uh, fetish fetishized, can't say that word right now. <laughs> and it's, that is an absolute problem. Think of how many images you've seen with the native woman, right? With the, with the war paint and the headdress. First of all, very few tribes allow native women to wear full headdresses like that. Whenever you see that's completely inaccurate. Um, but we're very hypersexualized. And you see this too with, with, with black girls perceived to be older than they actually are, right? So you see this in a lot of areas within our culture and in the way that American people view us. Since day one in this country, we like the native the, the image of a native woman has been the quintessential symbol of America, this virgin untouched sought after land. Um, and it's something that we always hung over Europe and Britain too, right? It's what we it's what Americans had that Britain didn't was Native Americans. 
So it really became as a symbol to represent Americanism. Why do you think the Boston Tea Party's dressed up as native people as they tossed the tea over the side of the boat? It was something that we had that they didn't. And so this kind of whole mentality of Americanism and the native image has been so deeply embedded into the psyche of this country and it has been stuck there. And there has been zero progress um, or even like efforts to start changing that until recently. And the reason that is, is because we are collecting power. We are gathering power. We are educating our people. We're educating um, non-natives as well. We're getting amazing allies. We're 1.5% of the country. We cannot do this alone. We need people to, to, to do the work, educate themselves, and join us by our side. What does allyship look like? And there was an earlier uh, panel uh, that talked a little bit about allyship, and I think it's a, an appropriate uh, conversation here as well. And also, um, I'm always big on providing people resources. I love whatever podcast you're listening to. I'm always like, oh, I write it down, and I, you know, uh, will start digging in there because I am constantly. I did grow up in Fresno, California. It does have a fairly large indigenous. American population, and I, my neighbors really were a, a family, an indigenous family, and um, went to school, went to high school with um, uh, so many amazing, amazing um, indigenous American women, uh, and I'm still so eager to learn, so hungry, fascinated, intellectually curious, um, because the truth always resonates. And um, so what, is, what are you reading? What are you listening to? What can you share? How can we be allies? How can we continue um, to grow our muscle um, to be useful? I always get this question um, when I do my presentations, right? And they're like, what book can I read to, to learn more about Native people in 21st century? Like, if I were to give you the book that you had to read, it would be like five feet thick and you wouldn't read it. Um, so think about how you get your news for like everything else in your life. How do you get that news? And how are you incorporating indigenous news into that feed, right? So who are you following on Twitter and Facebook, right? Uh, what podcasts are you listening to? Start just incorporating that into your day to day and you'll be surprised how much you start picking up on, especially um, from native news networks, right? Uh, from native thought leaders, experts, researchers, uh, you know, civil rights activists. You, you really will pick up on a lot. Um, th obviously there are some backgrounds the, uh, that you can do. Uh, the Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is an amazing groundbreaking book. There is a version also for young people if you have like a junior high or high school uh, age uh, kid that wants to learn more as well. Um, I also highly recommend the podcast uh, uh, Native Appropriations. It is um, a long series of a lot of like controversial, hot topic uh, button issues uh, for Indian country and it's amazing, uh, very approachable. And then also there's a recent podcast called This Land. I love that podcast. It honestly like- It was so, so good, it so good. It tackles so many of the um, modern, uh, specifically with tribal law and advocacy issues uh, that a lot of people don't have that background on and they really break it down like layman terms 101 and how not only like what it means but how it's impacting and harming or helping our communities. Uh, so This Land uh, by Rebecca Nagel, absolutely amazing listen. Well, sh and she's amazing. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, she, you know, you can follow her on Instagram and her podcast and yeah. she's just, all of that, so I'm a big fan of hers. Yeah, start liking some of uh, indigenous people on your on your stuff, and you'll be surprised how much you find. Uh, absolutely, I mean, clothing designers, jewelry designers, um, engineers, architects, um, just incredible uh, thought leaders that are so important to um, plug into, and will definitely enrich you. Sundance, do you have any? resources that you wanted to want to add or any thoughts or what you're listening to? Well, I, I have to say that it's very difficult for me personally to read anything historical. You know, we always lose at the end. We already know the outcome of, of these informative 
pieces. So as a lay person, uh, I would suggest, you know, the classic Custer Died for Your Sins by Vine Deloria Jr. Um, it is accessible. Uh, it is filled with humor as well as the hard truth. Um, it is still timely, having been written, you know, almost half a century ago now. Uh, in any case, I think that um, the original question was allyship. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can say what allyship is not. Allyship is not misappropriation of our culture. Um, our ancestors from the East Coast to the West Coast, you know, we are not monolithic people. We are peoples in different cultures. Uh, our ancestors have said, you cannot be on this land for so long without becoming yourselves indigenous people. So, and the way that that is done is by understanding what it means to be indigenous. I mean, we, I indigenous people, and this is true of people all around the world who are indigenous, we have a relationship, a relationship with the natural world. And oftentimes when we are speaking or engaged with uh, settler culture, there is this idea that in order for you all to have a relationship with the natural world, you have to somehow imitate us, you know, in thought and in action and insofar as dress, et cetera. So for us, many of us, allyship means your support of our self-determination, giving us the opportunity to be right and wrong, to overcome as well as make mistakes because we're people. It does not mean that we need any more help in determining who we are and who we want to be and what is best for us. That type of uh, thought is what is, well, that's what we call assimilation. And it's certainly patronizing to us to think that, uh, to have other people say to us, well, we know what is best. I mean, that is what our governments have been doing since contact here. Um, I, I like to note on that government issue, you know, we have talked about mascots and talked about how it has been detrimental. I mean, when we look at the Washington team who changed their name um, not too long ago, the government officials in D.C., they have a fiduciary responsibility towards indigenous people. Their job, based on the agreements that our ancestors made with their ancestors, is to support and to help and to protect us. And thinking about that, it's very ironic might be the word, to think that, I mean, we, we all know that they have enacted laws in the past and, you know, now that oppress us as indigenous people. So their day job, they oppress us, and at night they go home and root for redskins. Are mascots cultural misappropriation gone wrong? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, if you look at how these started, right? I, what, this is another question I often get is, how did they even become a thing, right? How, when, who thought, I'm gonna stick, you know, Chief Wahoo on a hat, who thought that? Um, and if you, and I, I, I mentioned this a little bit ago about how native imagery has become the quintessential symbol of Americanism, 
okay? Uh, during the 1800s, like turning into the 1900s, right, going into the 20th century, uh, there was like this culture shift in America, right? You think of uh, the, the West was considered one, right? Westward expansion, a period of a great American, uh, a, a, a great American era, right? We had, you know, the, the, the Industrial Revolution, westward expansion, um, you know, everyone's got this homestead act going on. Like, there's just so much great stuff happening for Americans. Uh, but if you look at the lived experience of the indigenous people, that is not what we were experiencing. In fact, that is quite possibly one of the worst eras for native people. Mass genocide, land removal, forced removal, our children were being snatched up and shoved into boarding schools where the motto was to kill the Indian and save the man. Uh, it, and we are still seeing that trauma, that generational trauma from our grandparents, our great grandparents, and often even some of our parents, aunties and uncles who have gone through those boarding schools. Uh, so that is now rippling effect in today. Um, but a lot of these imagery, it happened because as they were going through this period of great American progress uh, and the West was one, they got nostalgic about that almost immediately, mm -hmm. about the Wild West, mm -hmm. almost immediately. And nostalgia sells. How many reboots have we seen on TV today? Movies, Jurassic Park's back, they did the Independence Day, we have all these TV shows coming back, you know, all these millennials bringing back all their cartoons on their t-shirts they'd like to wear. Uh, it sells, and that happened then, the same exact thing. They latched on to that American nostalgia, onto that American symbolism, and slapped it on baking powder cans, onto motorcycles. I don't know what we have to do with baking powder, but okay. Uh, and then also like butter, we were on Lando Lakes. <laughs> Most Native Americans are lactose intolerant, so the irony of that just really hits home. <laughs> um, so we just start getting put onto a lot of random items. Literally, it was a marketing ploy. Mm -hmm. And so you see at the turn of the century, which is around the same time that the Cleveland baseball team changed their team name uh, to kind of latch onto that marketing fad. It had nothing to do with honoring, because if you think about what period, you know, were the experiences that we were having that exact time. I mean, we're talking less than 20 years after Wounded Knee when this team changed their name. What honor, what period were they honoring? That was not it. And we would know full well from the studies that we're looking at that that is not the case and that's not what's happening. Um, so if you look at kind of the nostalgia of this country and how these came to be, I mean, that's it. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to see the erasure of the, the culture. And you mentioned boarding schools. And these were literally schools that were designed to put an imprint of assimilation. Uh, another thing that a lot of people don't recognize is that historically black colleges were all often called um, normal uh, colleges and they you would find both um, African Americans and indigenous Americans, indigenous people um, at historically black colleges, these normal colleges, um, because it was about, uh, it was also about assimilation. And uh, you know, I graduated from from uh, Hampton, and uh, not long ago, a, a friend from California who came and and um, brought her film about Wilma Mankiller, and we were talking. Uh, the director, Valerie Redhorse, and she said, "Oh, my father went to Hampton." And again, these were schools about the erasure, the complete erasure of culture. Um, so when you said, I, I believe the language you said was kill the native, s kill the kill Indian, and save the man, save the man. That is, there was literally a process for it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, I mean, if you think about it too, so we were forcibly, like our culture was being forcibly stripped from us. We were not allowed to be native. But at the same time, we had mass corporations, sports teams using that imagery of, of native, of nativeness, indigenous identity, and using it to sell products. And that's not okay. So <laughs> just that, that irony right there gets me every time. You know, it's been less than 100 years since we became citizens of the land that we have inhabited since time immemorial. Yeah, that's a, that is, I, I mean, when you really think about that, 
it's it's just like mind blowing. Yeah, I, I've it, you know, I mean, it's I've it's beyond <laughs> obscene. Yeah, you know? Every native could not vote in this country until 1962. Like legally could not vote, and that was when Utah uh, like passed the law enfranchising Native people. 1962, like uh, not like they just were they had barriers to the ballot box. Like I'm talking, they literally it was illegal for them to vote. Um, we couldn't govern ourselves until 1975. There was a periods of of uh, federal policy that said, okay, you can govern yourself. No, just kidding. Okay, you can again. Actually, no, you're not Native anymore. And then, okay, yeah, you can do it again. 1975. And I think the one fact that a lot of people don't realize, 1978, we were, it was against federal law to practice our religions. Like you could go to prison for smudging, for hosting sun dances, for having a sweat in a sweat lodge, going to Longhouse. That was against federal law. So a country where that is like one of our first, you know, articles in our constitution is the right to religion. Like we did not experience that or have that because they were, they were threatened by it, right? And so 1978, that is two years before my sister was born. Like, this isn't something like some old, like, time, like, back in the day, like, oh, just get over it. That was so long ago. Literally six years before my birth, right? And it's, that is how close this is to us and the, how close this trauma is to us. And so when we talk about Native mascots and they're harmful to our people and they're not helping us and it's, you know, perpetuating stereotypes, it's part of systemic racism. This is the lived experience that we're talking about. In, uh, in our closing comment, um, what is your, what is within our grasp? What is next? What is um, your hope for your children, both of you, and our children, the children of Northeast Ohio, the children of America? I, I think, you know, change is on the horizon. It has been a painful struggle for all of us. Sometimes things have to get better before, sometimes, I'm sorry, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Um, people do not become radicalized often until it touches them personally. Now, for Native peoples, we have been touched personally at every instant of contact. That means that those people who have not yet been radicalized to this notion of equity and inclusion, well, something has to happen to make that shift. Now, we can all choose to go ahead into the future together and try to understand where each other are coming from, or we can continue to deny that problems actually exist. We can continue to deny that indigenous people actually exist. We can continue to say, hey, you lost the war. Get over it. I hear that all the time. Why is that uh, an expression? Because it is a shortcut to thinking. Mm. If you want to honor the truth, you must tell the truth. So on my way here, or just before I came here, uh, I was on a walk with my daughters and my husband, they were riding their bikes. And we were going down a street and one of the houses had a Chief Wahoo flag hanging down. And my daughter looked at it and she just like sighs. She's six. And I said, what's up? And she goes, I just see it everywhere. And it's just, I just can't not see it, mom. Like, it's, I, I have to look at it, and I can't not see it. 
And that's heartbreaking, right? When you are raising a child and you do everything in your power to protect them and there's just like this systemic, institutionalized, normalized depiction of what two-thirds or the dominant amount of this country perceives our people to be, that is not reflective of what she's at, she sees at home. That is not reflective of what she sees her grandma Nokomis, her aunties and uncles, her cousins, and our family at home. And so like, that's the most troubling part about being a parent um, here in Cleveland and for the thousands of other indigenous kids across the country that um, go to schools with native mascots, go to colleges with native mascots. Um, there's two, I think almost 200 schools, K through 12 schools in Ohio right now that still have native mascots. I think we're the, the largest number in the United States and the second highest concentration in the United States. And you see this pattern of the concentration in states like Ohio that don't have federally recognized tribes, uh, like Pennsylvania, Indiana, uh, Ge uh, Georgia. So it's like almost like they're making up for something. But if I were to wish something for my daughters, it was that they can go through their daily lives without having to explain their existence not having to explain who they are in their identity to the average person. That who they are and who their people are today is just understood. Because that is the first hurdle that we have to get over every single time we talk about an issue about Indian country, is we have to first stop and educate that person. And imagine how much we can get done if that is behind us. So that is the world that I hope and envision for my daughters, is that their mere existence does no longer needs to be explained. Thank you both for sharing your wisdom with us today here at the um, NFL Draft uh, Velocity Summit. And I just want to thank you both. And of course, um, just the uh, Cleveland Sports Commission and all the amazing uh, partners that made all of this happen. Uh, would you all join me in thanking Cynthia and Sundance for this amazing conversation?